all we have got as far as the fourth jhana, which is quite nice. <laughs> uh, and interestingly enough, this particular discourse does not speak about the other four. And the commentary says something about that. The attainment of direct knowledge does not succeed by mastery over the fine material form attainments alone without mastery over the immaterial attainments. Thus, the immaterial attainments are indispensable for achieving direct knowledge. And then comes a question, which is in the commentary, actually, question and answer. If the immaterial jhanas are to be included in the text, then why did the exalted one give a short account without mentioning them? And the answer is because the fourth jhana of the fine material form sphere is the basis for all the direct knowledges, for even though the immaterial jhanas are indispensable, the latter take the fourth jhana of the fine material form as their special basis. Therefore, in order to show that the fourth jhana is their basis, the teaching is presented stopping there at the fourth jhana. But this does not mean that the immaterial jhanas are unnecessary. Then the commentator says, the immaterial jhanas should be brought in and explained. There are some discourses in the Middle End sayings which only explain the, the immaterial jhanas. And then there are other discourses of the Middle End sayings, the Majjhima Nikaya, which explain the whole eight. And if I had them here, we could see what the Buddha says about them, but I don't have my library here. It's too difficult to carry that on airplanes. So, um, but the commentary says it has to be taken also. They have to also be used, explained, brought in and explained as the words. The fourth jhana is the springboard for the other four. And practically speaking, it sometimes happens that people do the first three and then, without any intent, go into the fifth. But they are then instructed to go back into the fourth. It is not useful to leave any of them out until one has become completely skilled at using them and then one can skip around. So the fourth one, being a very concentrated one, is the base for the next four. Now, just because it is of some interest, I'll read out what it says, translated out of the Visuddhimagga. Now, if you remember, I said the Visuddhimagga, which is the path of purification, is the most detailed commentary that we have for the Buddha's teaching. It's a very fat book, very dry, and extremely detailed on has everything in it that one could possibly want. But it's not a book that one can read, it's a reference book. It is not canonized, does not belong to the Pali canon, because it wasn't written until the 5th century of our time. The only thing that belongs to the Pali canon is everything that was orally transmitted up to the time it was written down. But it's still used enormously for explanation. So in the Visuddhimagga it says this, and when you have heard it, you will know why I say it's very dry. <coughs> Through the total overcoming of the corporality perceptions, however, 
and through the vanishing of the reflex perceptions and the non-attention to the multiformity perceptions, at the idea unbounded is space, he reaches the sphere of unbounded space and abides therein. By corporality perception are meant the, the jhanas of the fine material sphere, as well as those objects themselves. By reflex perceptions are meant those perceptions that have arisen due to the sense organs and the sense objects. They are a name for the perception of visible objects, etc. As it is said, what are the, the what are there the reflex perceptions? They are the perceptions of visible objects, sound, taste, smell, touch, etc. Surely they do no longer exist even to one who has entered the first jhana. For at such a time the five sense consciousness is no longer functioning. Nevertheless, this is to be understood as having been said in praise of this immaterial jhana in order to incite the striving for it. Multiformity perceptions are called the perceptions that arise in, multifor in multiform fields or the multiform perceptions. Here I, by according to Vibhanga, are meant the multiform perceptions outside the jhanas. <laughs> now we know what milk looks like huh? this is typical and I've read it out just to show an example of what we usually have to deal with um, as the canon is translated and has been translated into English for 100 years already. And some of the, tr this is not 100 years, the Visuddhimagga hasn't been that long, but it's only, Visuddhimagga is only about 40 years translated. But some of the stuff is translated 100 years ago, and now it's being renewed and so forth. So one has to really plow through it. I'll explain it. I've read this. We can dispense with this. Uh, from a practical standpoint first, the feelings which are very much akin to the uh, simile which I gave you yesterday of the person in the desert and then being very excited about seeing water, happy to be near it, then contented to have it, and then resting. It is, the first four, seem to have first excitement, and as if the mind is going up, which is just the manner of speaking. It's got nothing to do with direction. It just has that feeling about it. And in third and fourth, it seems to be going down. It is going into a rest, state in the force. Now, obviously, one has already noticed by this time that each of the jhanas that we have left behind is less subtle than the next one. So we are getting into a finer and finer uh, mental situation or emotional situation all of the jhanas are feelings so now having come out of the force although this is very fine and also very subtle the mind has a feeling of having been compressed it is as if it is in the bottom of a deep well it has complete rest there and yet it gets into this it has a feeling of having been down somewhere and it has a natural tendency to want to go up and expand because it's been so compressed so one-pointed if it doesn't have that natural tendency to go up and expand one can deliberately do it and the first one is called the first of the non-material or immaterial jhanas. The first one, which is the fifth one, is called the infinity of space. 
Now these next four jhanas are called immaterial because in our daily lives we do not have anything that even has any connection with these states. We do not have any reference points. With the first four, as I've already explained, we do have reference points. First one is very pleasant sensation, physical, we have reference point. Joy, we have. Contentment and peacefulness, well, we do know some of that. And a deep peace in the force may be unknown in that depth, but we do have a certain reference point to peacefulness. It's not unknown that one has experienced peacefulness at one time or another. The next four, we have no reference points at all. That's why they're called immaterial. A rupa. The syllable a, a, in front, means non. So this one is called the infinity of space. And all what I've just read out is from the Visuddhimagga, from the commentary. The Buddha just says, having left the absorption of equanimity and one-pointedness behind, the meditator then goes to infinity of space. Period. That's it. That's all of it. And one may possibly, if one is still wondering about why this isn't being practiced and taught, maybe this is the reason because it isn't explained in detail. The detail which I've read out to you is of course available, but even that detail which I've read out to you is not extremely uh, informative. So it has a certain difficulty. Now this happens in from a practical standpoint that because the mind has that wish to expand, it gives a feeling of a expansion of body. The outline of the body at that time is uh, diffuse in any case. It doesn't feel like it feels now sitting here. But then comes that feeling of total expansion, as if this is com going outward, outward. It doesn't feel as if the body is going, getting big. It doesn't feel like it's getting to be a balloon or anything like that. It just feels as if the outline is disappearing and the mind goes with that expansion of the body outward. And it goes outward and sometimes just starting at the body and going outward, it just goes all the way. In other times, it may stop somewhere. At that time, from a practical standpoint, it's useful to go to the perception of sky, which is quite large, but bounded by our horizon. And at this time, we go far beyond the horizon. The mind just goes outward until there is nothing, no boundary, no limitation. And the only perception that there is, and there is an observer observing all this, is that spaciousness is, space is, no limits, no boundaries, and also no separate entities within. In other words, there's no person there or anything else, no separateness at all. So the Buddha does explain that at, in one of the suttas, Yes, and this is what this is meant here. This is this multiformity. Uh, quite funny, actually. Does this word actually exist? Multiformity? <laughs> Never heard of such a thing. <laughs> multiformity perception are called the perceptions that arise in multiform fields or the multiform perceptions. Um, what is meant here is that in ordinary daily life, in ordinary life, we have perception of people, trees, um, houses, villages, towns, 
cities, um, small items, bigger items, connected items like in a city. Buddha explains at one stage that you no longer look at the trees, at the forest, at the towns, at the villages, just go beyond all that. That's the multiformity, the multiform fields are called here. I don't know whether that's a very elegant translation, but anyway, that's what's meant by it. That you no longer have any perception of separate, separate, ent- uh, separate things or separate entities. And he uses that description of what we see on this earth. From a practical standpoint, it is far easier to go to the sky because there is no interruption in the sky anyway and use that to go into infinity if the mind doesn't do it on its own. It seems to be a movement which goes up and out, but that also is not the same for everyone. In some cases it goes forward and up and sometimes whatever. But it just, it it results in an awareness of an immensity in which there's nothing to be found. Now, although there is an observer in it who sees all that or knows all that, um, it still is a very restful situation because there's nothing happening. Nothing at all. And the only thing that there is is an observer knowing that. There was one other thing mentioned here that was multiformity. What was the other thing? Other reflex perceptions. Oh, well, that's due to the senses. Our, <clears throat> our reactions to our sense perceptions are called here the reflex perceptions. But as it's said quite rightly, one hasn't had those ever since the first jhana, so why mention it again? But they say that the reason for mentioning is that it's a nice thing to have, and so it would uh, incite one to strive. Now, striving is also not exactly uh, what we're after. Determination is necessary. Determination which puts the mind in the right direction. That's essential, to put the mind in the right direction. If we don't put the mind in the right direction, we'll, we don't know where we're going. And the mind is a very unruly entity and just does anything. In fact, it plays tricks. It plays such bad tricks on people that they don't even know it. So we have to be really careful with the mind. We have to really um, watch out over it as if it was um, not only as it is the most valuable and uh, wonderful thing there is in the universe, but also, also in a way that it is extremely vulnerable. We never should forget how vulnerable the mind is and be very, very careful with it, with our own mind, not other people's. They'll have to be careful with their minds. If we are careful with our own mind, we have no uh, way to hurt. So the, the striving is something that we can easily misunderstand because it has, for us, the achievement syndrome connotation, which in the East, is in Asia, is not that prominent as it is in the West. That's why we have all the technology and they don't, because we do have the achievement syndrome. So when they say striving, it's not so dangerous. When we say striving, it is. And obviously this was written in Asia. Um, So we have to watch out that we see that properly. We need determination. 
we need mind direction. We need to know why we're doing what we're doing. We need to understand that this is the most valuable thing we can be doing. And then we have to just stick with it. Be there and no place else. So we mustn't misunderstand this word striving and then get this achievement syndrome where we then are disappointed if we don't get it and uh, have expectations and disappointments and don't even pay attention. Because this is the danger. If we have this achievement in mind, then we have the achievement instead of the concentration in mind. And then, of course, all is lost. So that's this word striving. The reflex are the reactions to our senses. Obviously, we do without them. This particular meditative uh, process of the infinity of space has an extremely insightful result and fifth, sixth and seventh jhana are called the vipassana jhanas, the inside jhanas. One cannot experience them without getting inside. It's impossible. The inside may dissipate again, or may forget about it, but it never is completely lost. One can always get back to it. The insight which arises is the fact that after we come out of it, we can then reflect, where was I while all this was going on? And obviously, I wasn't anywhere. Because if I was there, there would be no infinity of space. Because I am a very small space. And that's infinity of space. So the answer is obvious from the start. But it needs to be reflected upon in order to give it the impact. Because obviously one experiences it. And this is something that happens in all the jhanas. We experience them, we're happy with them, we, it's very nice and uh, we don't have to worry whether what we're going to do in the meditation. But we need to reflect at the end of the jhanas. What does this tell me? What have I learned from this? And it's a very, very important aspect. So here we have a very definite experience of the me not taking part other than in the form of the observer. And this is what usually is the result. Okay, I wasn't there as a person, as a body, but I'm certainly there as an observer. So from then on, the me is considered to be an observer, which is fine because that too disappears. But at that point, it's the observer. And uh, that appears to be quite justified because obviously the observer was there and now I know what the observer has observed. So, surely. Having been able to do four, everybody can do the next ones. And as I've said before, everybody can do all of them, so there's no reason to think that one can't get into these. They are also, interestingly enough, after one does them a few times, the re reaction to them is that they are obvious and... Uh, just exactly what one does. It's just what one does. It doesn't have anything special about it anymore. It's the first, maybe three times, that it appears to be something special, if that often. And then the mind is totally at ease and knows that's it. This is the way the mind goes. This is an ordinary, normal way for the mind to go. Naturally, it's also normal for the mind to be hateful. That's also normal. But having been able to be concentrated, one starts to make choices. And these choices will definitely lead us upward. When we are 
in a situation with the mind where we are not able to make choices where the mind still plays tricks on us then it's a different story but having come this far we can make choices and then we choose this way the fifth one which is the first one of the immaterial jhanas has a reference point to the very first jhana because the very first jhana is delightful sensations bodily based and this one is infinity of space which is also appears to reach out from the body we only have body and mind so it's either that or that now when we go from the first to the second we change the focus from the physical sensation which is delightful to the reaction to it which is joy which is emotional well here we now change the focus from the fifth to the sixth from that space space that we've experienced which is actually physical because space is physical to that which is experiencing the space and that which is experiencing the space has to be infinite consciousness if it is limited consciousness it will experience limited space if it is personal consci- consciousness as we all know it to be in everyday life then it will experience personality and with all that experiencing of limitation and personality the mind is warped and because we have so many lifetimes and so many times in this life experienced limited consciousness and personal consciousness the mind is warped it doesn't have the clarity of simplicity the simpler the mind is the clearer it is the simplicity of just being there and just seeing what there is all the ramifications all the proliferations all the mind made ideas hopes and wishes are all contrary and counterproductive to liberation so the practical aspect is that the focus which was on the space can just change to that which is experiencing the space which has to be consciousness and since the space is unlimited infinite the consciousness is too now this is a very um um very important uh, breakthrough in understanding and in insight it appears from a practical standpoint as if consciousness is everywhere completely without any boundary and any limitation knowing everything but within that everything there is no thing okay that's the best i can do <laughs> the breakthrough comes when after it is over one reflects and this is essential that we reflect that's called jyotisho maniskara that means wise reflection we reflect what was it that i just experienced and what one has just experienced at that time is that there is consciousness but it isn't mine it never has been mine there's no nowhere that i can say this was my consciousness it is unlimited it is totally encompassing and it knows everything but within that everything nothing appears 
So with that experience, one has had a foretaste of what it means to be without this unfortunate clinging to the me illusion. And I think the word unfortunate is just about as fitting as any other word one can think of. It is not a sin, it is uh, a mistake, it is an error which is inbred, but it is unfortunate. And because in the space, in the infinity of space, we were aware of an observer, this has now changed in the infinity of consciousness there is an infinity of observer there isn't my observer naturally when one comes out one knows what one has experienced but the experience is one of an infinite knowing and obviously this person cannot have infinite knowing so there must be something wrong with our perception of person and it is very common that both of those experiences five and six give rise to the understanding that the whole aspect of this me idea is just a completely mistaken view which one has carried around for no good purpose at all just because everybody else is carrying it around too and that as one is cured from it so to say from that wrong perception one sees everything in a totally different light that does not mean enlightenment it just means that one sees everything in a totally different light and therefore, the jhanas are of such great value because they pave the way. They pave the way towards that step where we can let go of that unfortunate clinging that we have. Because we have noticed already that it's a mistaken view. We have experienced something entirely different. And not only have we experienced that it is a mistaken view, we have also experienced that it is much more pleasant to be without that mistaken view. It is a great relief, it is uh, um, peaceful, it is, uh, um, doesn't have any worries in it, doesn't have any um, work in it, doesn't have any restlessness in it, it doesn't have any craving in it and so it is much more desirable and since we have now seen that it is more desirable we don't have this well in most cases anyway we don't have this fear that letting go of the me illusion is going to uh, put an end to our enjoyments this is one of the most common fears if I let go of me Who's going to have all the fun? And even though it's not said like that, usually, that's exactly what's meant. Here we have a totally different experience. We know that this is the way where we can actually experience that what we've been looking for. An expanded consciousness, an elevated consciousness, which doesn't have any of the uh, usual dukkha in it. The jhanas are still dukkha. And why? Because they're also anicca. They don't stay with us. So that is another thing which has to be seen every time we do them. At the end, we see their dissolution. And we look at it and say that too is impermanent, there's got to be more. And seeing that, we don't have this supposed danger of being attached to them. 
which I've already answered the other day. We know that they too can't stay with us. In fact, with the jhanas, it's an interesting thing that if we don't practice them every day, we lose our ability to do them and have to start all over again. Naturally, the second time over, it's easier. It goes quicker. But one feels uh, probably quite bereft. So this is something one has to practice every single day. I always compare that with yoga exercises where one stretches one's muscles. And if one stops stretching one's muscles in yoga exercise, one's got to start all over again, stressing, stretching them again. Here, we have stretched the mind. We have let go of contracted mind. Contracted mind is a, is a terminology which um, means, in the first instance, when we are hateful, lying, cheating, um, any negativity is contracted mind. But it also has the implication of the ordinary marketplace consciousness. That's contracted. Because what do we know? Only the things of the world. We go by what we see with our eyes, we go by what we hear with our ears, we go by what we want and don't want. So that's contracted mind. Expanded mind is the mind that is allowed to reach infinity. And of course, if we practice that, we can do that. And then if we don't practice, it contracts again and goes back to where it was, where it's interested in its own um, perpetuation, the ego perpetuation. This is what we're after, the ego perpetuation, which is our, our difficulty. So the first two, infinity of space and infinity of consciousness, are extremely useful for not only the inside of knowing that there wasn't anybody there at the time, but also for paving the way for us that this is actually where we want to go, without any fear. Fear is often also a deterrent on the inside path. In fact, fear can be one of the past, um, uh, inside path steps, but it can be a great deterrent if one doesn't have um, a teacher to explain it. Here, when infinity of space and infinity of consciousness is actually experienced, Fear does not arise, on the contrary. It's um, a feeling of um, joyfulness and a feeling of great um, confidence that it is possible to get out of all dukkha. Because this has a sort of like a bit of a, um, the trademark of it already. It isn't the final result by any means. All the jhanas are called mundane lokya they are not super mundane because they haven't gone to nibbana to the super mundane but paving the way is one of the most important aspects that we can find the um, sixth one through the total overcoming of the sphere of unbounded space, the infinity of space is called unbounded space here, and at the idea unbounded is consciousness, one reaches the sphere of unbounded consciousness and abides therein. Well, that's just about um, one of the worst translations, by the way, but that is um, just about what the Buddha says about it, and it's usually called infinity of space, and the idea, yeah. what, is it? what is it usually I translate as? The, um, no. the, the direction or the, the mind direction that consciousness is infinite, one reaches the sphere of infinity, of infinity of consciousness and abides therein. Nothing further is ever said about this one. The um, 
If one reaches the fifth one, one has to reach the sixth one. They belong together. Just as the first and the second belong together. The first one has the pleasantness which results in happiness and the fifth one has the infinity of space which has to be seen by infinity of consciousness. There's no choices. One just has to know where to put one's mind. And the Buddha himself called himself the shower of the way. He shows us the way, but we've got to do it. Now, obviously, these jhanas, and particularly the immaterial ones, are the kind of stuff that religious experience is made of, except it isn't happening anymore. In the Middle Ages, all the Christian mystics did exactly that. They called it something else. They didn't call it jhana. They didn't speak Pali. They spoke Latin. And uh, they didn't have the uh, imagery that uh, the Buddha uses when he gives similes. They had the imagery that they use with um, Jesus and... Uh, the bridegroom and the um, beautiful chamber and uh, all these things are to be found that's exactly what they did it's exactly the same thing this is the religious experience now the Buddha's innovation and his great contribution for mankind unfortunately much too little use made of it is the understanding that while we go through them and have this spiritual experience, that's not the end. There's more to it. In Christianity, very often, just as in Hinduism, eight jhanas were considered to be all of it. That's all. Because the experience is extremely... Um, satisfying and has a totally connotation of from that what we know if there is no teaching then how would one know that there's more one of the best descriptions in Christianity is given by Teresa de Villa in the interior castle it's an excellent description she uses seven chambers we've got eight Meister Eckhart, the greatest of the Christian mystics of all time, one could say, describes it without any of the imagery. And it's not easy to find, but if one knows what is one is looking for, one can find it in his description too. One of the easiest descriptions to understand is um, the teacher of Teresa de Villa, which is um, de Asuna, I think it's Joseph, Jose de Asuna, which is totally unknown, but very easy to understand. One can see exactly that they're doing the same thing. Naturally, there are still pockets today, unknown probably, where people practice this. Probably in all of the religions. Most of the time one never hears about it. But... As a general teaching, it's a lost art on all levels. Buddhism, Catholicism, anywhere you go, it's a lost art. Unfortunately, because it's not difficult. It is something that is available to every sincere meditator. unless there are some physical or mental uh, blockages which first have to be ironed out, but it's available to anyone. And hopefully it will be available again one of these days also to Catholicism, because if it is, then that would help greatly for some 
peaceful situation in this world. Between the fifth and the sixth, there is hardly necessary to make a determination. It is quite an easy transition in most cases. I say, say sometimes things which are generalities and personally one may experience it a little different which is quite all right. But generally speaking it is an easy transition because the two are really connected and it is changing one's focus. The seventh is called the base of nothingness. Let's see what it says. Through the total overcoming of the sphere of infinity of consciousness and with the direction nothing is there, one reaches the sphere of nothingness and abides therein. That's all that's ever said. Now when we hear the words the sphere of nothingness, most people, those that haven't done it, get the idea that there's nothing there. It's nothing. So actually if there's nothing, why should one do it if it's nothing? But that's not the way it is. Our language are deficient in explaining matters which go beyond the physical and go beyond our everyday consciousness. So we don't have sufficient vocabulary to make the distinction between what we call nothing and everyday life and what we call nothing in the uh, sphere of nothingness. There's a very interesting book by a bhikkhu in Thailand, Bhikkhu Buddhadasa, very old now, about 85 years old, and it's called the Dhamma language. That's the same words that we use in everyday language mean something entirely different when we use it for Dhamma. So this business with nothingness. If you come into this room, you see people, cushions, flowers, statue, pictures, curtains, a lot of stuff. And each one seems to have a significance, especially if it's yours. Nobody should take it away. And then somebody comes and takes everything away. And so you come into the same room and there's nothing in it. So you become aware of the fact that actually all that stuff that was there didn't really have any significance. It's actually much nicer without it. There's nothing there. And that's the sphere of nothingness. Having experienced unbounded or infinity of space and infinity of consciousness, both of those are understood and experienced as an infinity in which there's nothing at all to be found. Even space and consciousness are now no longer the focus of attention. The focus of attention is directed toward that which tells that there is nothing. It is infinite, but it's got nothing in it. So we could say that it's infinity without anything in it, which is maybe easier to understand than nothingness. And that's nothingness, infinity without anything in it. And once having been there, one knows exactly what it looks like. The first time on the second time and maybe the third time it's interesting and after that it's just the way things are and again we have a very profound poss possibility of a very profound insight from that after it's over not while we're doing it always afterwards the review the reflection upon what happened. Because if we do it while we're in it, then of course we're no longer in it. 
So we have to wait till we come out of it. And what we see is that there is nothing of any significance anywhere to be found in the universe. It is all empty of anything that has solidity, durability, anything that we can hang on to, hold on to, that we can actually name. It just doesn't have anything like that. And from that, very often comes also the understanding that all this stuff that we're naming all the time, cushions and people and birds and cats and dogs and and male and female and nice and ugly and wonderful and I want to and I don't want to, all that is a game. A game in which we get lost and then think we've got to win. Like all children when they play games, they want to win. And that makes life so uncomfortable. Always wanting to win this game that we're playing. It uh, can be also compared to a Punch and Judy show. It just isn't there, it's just all a game, a, a play, a show. It doesn't have the reality to it that we give it. The minute we take away the reality from it and just realize that with this body we've got to be in it, but that's all, that moment we live in it easy, with oil wheels, no fear, no anxiety, no achievement, no wanting, no pretending, nothing. It's just happening and it happens constantly. But going back into the these three jhanas, which are the inside jhanas, and maybe just the seventh one at this point, we know that that is really the way it is. That this has nothing to recommend it, nothing at all. But when we let go of the significance of it, then it's quite okay. It's all right. When it's no longer significant, it's all right. Then it's just happening. Sai Putta, who was the um, right-hand disciple of the Buddha, had a teacher who was teaching him the basics first before he became the disciple of the Buddha who was also a, a, dis, a disciple of the Buddha and this teacher s said and there's nothing in the whole canon except this one sentence let us live until this body breaks up that's all. That's all we're doing. We're living until the body breaks up. He was asked by Sai Putta what was the most important thing to do. That was his answer. That's the only thing that we have um, in the whole of the canon by that particular teacher who was a fully enlightened Arahant. That's all, we, that's, all that's necessary. That's all we have to do. Just live until the body breaks up. There's nothing to be done. It's all been done already. But look at all the things that we're constantly doing and constantly engaged in, constantly worry about, constantly want, constantly don't want, constantly uh, have ideas about, the plans until we recognize the fact that all this is tremendous dukkha we're probably going to go on doing it these jhanas are 
a tremendous help to see this clearly. They are the meditative path that the Buddha prescribed, that he went himself, that he taught, which will give us a totally different view of ourselves and the universe. Having seen all that, and maybe even being able to let go for the first um, past moment, it doesn't mean that we don't live in normally like everybody else. We do. But the distinction, one might say, could be that all the worry and the achievement syndrome and the uh, anxiety is all gone because what is there to be anxious about what is there to achieve what is there uh, to worry about the Buddha said like this there's a deed but no doer there's suffering but no sufferer there's a path but no one to enter it. And there's Nibbana, but no one to attain it. So we can have Nibbana, but not when we want to get something. It's one of these nice paradoxes that will get clear as we do it. The, um, I will, I will, also explain the last one, the eighth one, although there's nothing to explain, um, so that we're, that we're finished with the jhanas and uh, get on to our inside path. I'll read out what it says. Through the total overcoming of the sphere of nothingness, or the base of nothingness, one reaches the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception and abides therein. Good. The, uh, the eighth one is uh, related to the fourth one in that it is a very uh, complete and profound rest for the mind, but it differs from the fourth one where in the fourth one the mind knows that it is at peace, in the eighth one it has just a bare inkling of it. Even the observer is eliminated to the point where at times one can't even be aware of the observer. The awareness arises when coming out of the eighth and the mind knows it has, the most prof has had the most profound rest and rejuvenation and regeneration that it has ever had. So this is not an inside jhana, not a vipassana jhana. There's absolutely no insight to be gained because nothing is happening. And the awareness is not even there. It's neither perception nor non-perception. The mind is not perceiving as it usually does. So that's why it's the most profound rest. This is strictly a samadhi state, samatha, calm, tranquility. But it is so important for the mind to be able to do that because it gains the strength that it needs for enlightenment. A mind which doesn't have that kind of power cannot come near the power which lies in the enlightenment factors. It is something that gives the mind its the basis for non-fear and no care. See, as long as we care about certain things, we're attached to them. And as long as we care, this affection thing about this or that, as long as we do that, we can't really let go. 
So the letting go is being the kernel, the hub of the whole of the spiritual path, the AIDS is a great help. It does not bring any insight. It is desirable to do all eight. There's no reason why one can't and shouldn't. If one does some of them, one can do all of them. The, um, it is often that the, uh, only four of them are mentioned, but as you heard at the beginning, that doesn't mean that only four of them should be done. The experience of the higher jhanas brings the mind to a realization that what we see and know on this level of consciousness is so limited that it is really like a child's play. The level of consciousness that we are connected with here on the human level is so minute when we only use the senses, including the thinking, that it cannot be ever bring the profundity of liberation. So it's a great joy to be able to do the higher jhanas because one realizes that being part of universal consciousness is exactly that which makes it possible for us to give up individual consciousness and be able to merge with well I don't like the word merge well never mind merge with universal consciousness or to let go of individual consciousness so that we allow only universal consciousness to be there. It does put a different connotation on this life. And it shows quite clearly it's the only important thing to do. There's nothing that one needs to then um, decide. The decision is made for one. From a practical standpoint, always it is necessary at the end to recognize the fact that the jhana also is impermanent and disappears again, so that there's no question about the fact that from that altered state of consciousness we can go towards the insight stages. When I'll talk about the insight, we will have reference again to these jhana states, but only in a matter of, on the practicalities of it. Okay. Any questions? Yes. In going from five to six to seven, basically it's the same state, but a shift of focus. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. How does one go from seven to eight? It's a deepening, it's a very, it's a little similar to the three to four. In three, you have a feeling of contentment and then the peacefulness which is pretty on the surface still and go into the depths. Whereas in seven, because there's nothing there, the, um, there is a great deal of peacefulness already because there's nothing to do, nothing to see, nothing to know. So with that, rather on the surface, there's that peacefulness, letting go of everything that is surrounding that and letting the mind go into that a deeper peacefulness. And at that time, it does not revert back to four because it's been in five, six, and seven, it does go to eight, into the peacefulness of eight. The difference between four and eight is quite clearly marked. In four, 
there is a knowing of peacefulness of deep deep peacefulness in eight there is a an almost no knowing a, the barest knowing of 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 nothing of peacefulness yeah the barest knowing it's it's different the four seems to be very deep down and the eighth one is not that deep down it seems to just be as if the mind has said okay i'm going to take a rest from all this i've had enough and i'm just going to rest now and it isn't active at all it has no activity that in itself that having no activity is also a um like a, a sample or a, a model for eventually being able to go to where the mind has nothing no activity still point it's a little bit of a model for that so the seventh is already peaceful and on the surface only and then letting it go into the depths of peacefulness and as it goes into that depths it will go to the eighth another question you said that there are all the jhanas are emotions right emotions yes uh, i can see that very clearly with one two three and four yes i can relate them to yes uh, five six seven is not such a good statement is it uh, not, yeah, well, that's what i was going to ask could you discuss them as emotional states Well it's certainly I would I was using the word emotion in order to differentiate from thinking. So it's a feeling rather than thinking and I should have said feeling rather than thinking. Uh the word emotion applies to the first four very well whereas it then applies to the word the word feeling applies better. You feel the space, you feel the consciousness. It's not just a knowing the knowing is the understood experience which you do afterwards so you it would, feel it it would be an emotion because emotions are what we feel a feeling yes right. but we use the word emotion a bit differently so if i had said feeling it would be clearer wouldn't it you said feeling i said feeling thank you <laughs> <laughs> i read emotion in your book oh i should have changed that <laughs> you can proofread it i've proofread that thing about 10 times now you can do it for the 11th <laughs> yes michael um presumably you've seen a, a many people progress through the jhanas um how long does it take <laughs> <laughs> you're a naughty boy Michael. <laughs> yeah. What what is it that allows what are the factors that allow you to move through it is it gaining insight through life? Um the first question is unanswerable. <laughs> Because I have students particularly one I'm always thinking of who meditated for 21 years and then finally came to me and then finally did the first jhana and now he's so delighted with that i don't know he's 79 years old i don't know what's going to happen now um i also have students who did the first and second and third jhana in their very first meditation course and then i've got students everything in between between first meditation course and 21 years The Buddha said like this I'll tell you what the Buddha said and Buddha said there are those that practice the dhamma and they have an awful lot of dukkha and very slow progress and then there are those who have a lot of dukkha and very fast progress and then there are those that have a lot of sukha which is the opposite happiness and very slow progress and then there are those that have a lot of sukha and very fast progress <laughs> so you pick it out you pick the one you like 
Well, what's the what's the fastest from one to eight you've seen? <laughs> <laughs> one meditation course. Yeah. One three week course, huh? Peter, no? Three weeks. One three week course. That's about the fastest I've seen. Which is remarkable. Is that because of karma? Karma. Yes. It's absolutely karma. There's no other explanation at all possible. Because, I mean, obviously we've all got the same mind, especially if you come to the infinity of consciousness, you can realize, I mean, there are no separations. Everybody's got the same thing. So, um, uh, it's karma. One thing you can think of is that a person who does it fast like that has done it many lifetimes already. And uh, instead of getting enlightened, has to do it again now. I mean, you can just have compassion for that person. By no means should one envy such a person, because they've done it probably 50 or 60 lifetimes already and never got enlightened, so now they've got to sit again. And uh, (laughs) (laughs) so that's one thing, the karma of past lifetimes. Then it is also a question of purity. The less negativities one has in one's mind, in this lifetime, the easier it is. The more one has the purity of love and compassion already established and mindfulness. Now again, you can say quite rightly, that too has something to do with past lifetimes. However, it's not all fate, as we heard already in this discourse. We have choices. So even though we may come equipped with the ability to love and have compassion and have mindfulness, we may not use that ability or we may use it. So the more we have of those three factors, our moral conduct and mindfulness and uh, love and compassion, the easier it is. And it is not... not Sure, one wants it, yes, of course. But if you want it, you don't get it. You have to be concentrated. Um, To come to the final destination is not the criteria. The criteria is the journey. You see, if you go on a trip, and all the time while you're on this trip, you're only thinking... Oh, if I've only got there already, and if I could just be there and just rest in this hotel, and I just don't, it's going to be a very miserable journey. But if you enjoy every moment of the journey, it doesn't matter how long it takes till you get there. You're enjoying every moment of the journey. And the more you enjoy the journey, the easier the journey is, and the quicker it goes by. You see, time is not a given, although we think it is, because we've made these clocks. But who made them? We did. Human beings did. Time is totally arbitrary. Time is dependent upon concentration. And you've all experienced that. If you have a good meditation, the bell goes and you think, what? She must have made a mistake. And if you have a lousy meditation, you sit there and think, Sure, you've forgotten. I'm going to <laughs> Why doesn't she ring the bell? So it's, it's totally dependent upon one's concentration. If you have a fascinating book, you can stay up half the night and read it and don't even know that half the night is gone. And if you've got something boring to do, you'd rather go to sleep because it just doesn't seem, you know, that the time is passing at all. So time is not a given as we think it is, according to these clocks. They are utilitarian so that we know when to meet. That's their only usefulness. They don't have any spiritual value. So the, the, if you enjoy the journey and be concentrated on that journey, it doesn't matter how long it takes. What does it matter? We've been, we've been on this journey lifetimes. So what does one more lifetime matter? We just do the best we can. And this time we we struck it lucky. 
we got the instructions. <laughs> okay, anything else? Yes. Is there a residue to any of the a residual effect in daily life. Is that what you're saying? Yes. yes. Well, certainly. The uh, I think I have explained that already. I explained that about the um, fact that having experienced the um, infinity of space and the infinity of consciousness, one becomes quite imbued with the understanding that since that is the way it is, all this, is a Punch and Judy show. It, while we have to live it, we have to be in it, um, because the body is uh, on that level. We have the level of a human um, realm as a body. Our mind doesn't have to be in it. We don't get affected by it. It's, um, it's all, well, it's like a movie that's going on, and within that movie, some of the things are interesting, just like a movie. When you go to a movie, it's not, a, not the whole thing is not interesting. I mean, you're not interested in the cast so much and in who is the photographer and all the rest of it. You think some of the things that you see in the movie, they're very interesting, so you get fascinated. And other things, you get bored. Well, this is the same with this. And having seen infinity of consciousness and infinity of space, you're, that happens and then they have these things don't have a sting to them just like the movie show it doesn't have a sting to it it's just a movie hmm? another question then is after a meditation is over and I walk outside and colors are psychedelic yes is that a res residual of yes jhanas? yes <laughs> it's a residual of concentration it does not not even jhanas any concentration will do that. Okay. Having been very concentrated, the mind becomes one-pointed. Please put the attention on the breath for just a few moments. I like you to think once more of Anne Palm who is on her deathbed in a hospice here in Oakland and finds it difficult to let go. Give her your love. Hold her hand. Assure her that letting go is the most beautiful thing to do. It's non-resisting, non-fighting, giving in and giving up, flowing, creating no disturbance. There's nothing to leave behind. It's all ahead of her. With the love you give her, Try to give her that assurance and confidence.
And now imagine yourself lying on your deathbed. Give yourself lying there all your love. Let go. No wanting, no resisting, no fight. Flowing into another dimension. Nothing to lose. Now think of any old people you might know whose time for their death may be near. Picture them on their deathbed. Embrace them. Hold their hand. Help them in the transition, reminding them of all the good things they've ever done, reminding yourself of all the good things they've ever done, giving them strength and confidence to let go, leave this behind, have a new beginning. Now think of anyone whom you know who's younger than you are. Picture that person 
on his or her deathbed. Let go of wanting to have that person help him or her to let go. Give him or her all your love. and strength, and confidence, and joy for a transition to something new and beautiful. Think of those people whom you know and who have already died. Give them your love and your wishes for a beautiful new beginning. Think of all the people who may be terminally ill at this time, in hospitals, hospices, at home. Picture them in their beds, fighting for their lives. Embrace them with your love. Hold their hands. Imbue them with the strength to let go. To let go of a body which does no longer function. peacefully flow into a new beginning.
think of all the people who are grieving for a lost one, who are mourning the loss of a beloved person. If you know anyone, think of that person. If you don't know anyone specifically, think of all those who are grieving. Give them your love, your strength and your assurance that there's nothing to mourn about. The transition is one of joy.